All right, so welcome to the uh, European uh, version of the we not uh, Let me also uh, mute uh, some uh, of the um, participants. We have another report. Deswegen sind die Leute ein bisschen, also haben die Leute. Okay, so that's uh, taken care of. Sorry for that. Someone was on the phone. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Branimir Chachis in the uh, Global Nocturnal Geometry Seminar on Classical Gaze Theory on Quantum Principle Bundles. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Walter. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me. There's so many familiar names from way back when in the participant lists. It's, it's good to be back amongst friends, and I hope you're all doing well in these uh, uh, unprecedented trademark times. Um, so let me begin with some shameless self-promotion, and even before that, with a disclaimer, I'm a relative newcomer to quantum principle bundles, and I'm pretty sure that everyone in this audience has forgotten more about the subject than I, I will ever hope to know. So if I say anything egregiously uh, offensive, please uh, feel free to stop me at any time. Uh, so this is primarily based on a recent uh, excessively long preprint that uh, came on the archive at the end of uh, August. Um, but the motivation for a lot of this came from this paper with Bram, um, which basically deals with uh, non-commuted Ramanian principle bundles in the framework of spectral triples and unbounded K theory. So if you're happy to deal with just compact, com uh, compactly structure groups of the Dram by covariant calculus, and you're happy to just deal with structures uh, through first order differential calculus, uh, you can get everything you could ever hope to, to see in this paper here. In particular, if you want to see how unbounded KK theory in its, in its sort of in its very latest form can be used in a shamelessly <laughs> geometric fashion, uh, really as a back, black box for doing non commutative Riemannian geometry, um, take a look at this. You can do all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, as one last sort of disclaimer for, for shameless ease of simplicity and because it suffices for the case study, I just want to talk about quantum circle bundles over two dimensional bases. Uh, but I do want to stress that you can, you can do everything you want for arbitrary Hofstra algebras with arbitrary bicovariant calculi and arbitrary base so long as you do the other lazy thing and truncate all calculi past uh, at degree two. So. Let me begin at the beginning, and I want to begin by introducing the case study. Um, and the case study goes back to the very dawn, like the very beginning of 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 of, of, of a non computed differential geometry program, and it's this business of constant curvature connections on Heisenberg modules. So let us begin with some very very familiar objects. Let theta be an irrational number, and let's recall that the smooth non commutative two torus is the unital star algebra of rapidly decaying Laurent series and, and your usual uh, generators, u theta, v theta, which are unitaries that satisfy the famous uh, si, si, si. commutation no. relation. Do you uh, no. ah, no. no. So uh, things to note for, the, for, for later sorry. on, this is a dense and stable under the homomorphic functional calculus and it's C star algebraic completion. Uh, so it's, 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 it's k-naught is the same thing as the k-naught of the Seaster algebra, which via the canonical trace is just z plus z theta. And finally, we have the usual sort of partial derivatives on, on the smooth non-commutative torus, and they're given on these basic Fourier nodes uh, by the usual formulas. So what did, what did Alain consider in that compte rendu? Um, so suppose the G is a non-trivial element of SL2z. Given such a matrix, one can define a non-trivial right module over, over the non-commutative two torus A theta using the appropriate, uh, this is clock, if I recall correctly, and this is shift, if I recall correctly. So the GIJs are the entries of G. Um, this number G21 theta plus G22 will be, I believe, the rank, and G21 will be the degree, if I recall correctly, and this is one over slope or something like that. And so if you use uh, th this uh, clock operator and the shift operator, uh, one gets a representation on the right of the, of the, of the non-commutative uh, torus AC theta. And, and, and what the compte rendu uh, showed is that, first off, this is a non-trivial finally generated projective module over that rational non-commutative torus, and it rep represents this, uh, this number in k, k naught, uh, absolute value of G21 theta plus G22. 
moreover, you can define a constant curvature connection on this finally generated projective module on this non-commutative vector bundle over this irrational non-commutative two torus. Basically, the one uh, covariant derivative is, is differentiation in the continuous variable. And the other covariant derivative is, is basically, a, 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 again, a sort of funny uh, multiplication operator. And so these satisfy the appropriate Leibniz rule on the, on the right with respect to uh, the right module action. And the commutator is a constant. So there's more to this story. You can make these bimodules for the appropriate uh, irrational non commutative torus on the left. Uh, remember that SL2Z acts on irrationals by a, a fractional linear transformations. And you can note, you can see that the transformed irrational non commutative two torus parameterized by G act theta acts on the left via the appropriate, uh, the appropriately constructed uh, clock and shift. And now what Cohn proves in his compte rendu and what fits into some general theory of, of, of refills is that this is an equivalence by module from uh, A sub G act theta on the left to A theta on the right. So know what happens when G stabilizes, when G fixes theta. This is the case where theta is quadratic. Then you can view this Heisenberg bimodule as a non-trivial uh, line bundle on this irrational non commutative two torus. And so anachronistically, what I'd like to ask is, OK, you have these, no, um, these non-trivial line bundles over this irrational non commutative two torus. You have these constant curvature connections on them. Uh, what's the underlying U1 gauge theory at the level of principal bundles and principal connections? So that is what we're going to treat, use as our case study throughout to sort of motivate everything. So, so the first thing we need to do now is, un is understand what the underlying topological uh, circle bundle is. And to do that, uh, let me just recall some uh, folklore from a uh, very basic number theory that I'm shamefully ignorant of. So let's suppose that theta is quadratic, a quadratic real irrationality with discriminate delta. So this means that you can write theta as in this form, uh, as, as the root of a certain integer quadratic with coefficient a, b, c, and then the delta is just the discriminant of that quadratic. And then after a certain normalization, given by this and this, uh, you can make uh, this, this uh, triple a, b, c unique. That's, I believe, the type of the, of the quadratic irrationality. So once you have this, you have a, this, non, this, this uh, positive Pell's equation, x squared minus y squared delta equals 4, which has a fundamental positive solution, u, v. So what this means is that x equals u, y equals v solve this equation. That's a pair of natural numbers. And if you have any other positive solution of the, of the positive Pell's equation, um, s and t, uh, s will be greater than or equal to u, and t will necessarily be greater than or equal to v. And then to cut a long story short, the, no, the norm positive fundamental unit of the, of the real quadratic number field uh, given by theta uh, is given by, well, all suggestively denoted by q, q equals u plus v square root of delta over 2. So this will have a starring role uh, in the constructions to come. There will be a lot of things that will definitely look like q deformation. But the twist here is that we don't want just any q. Uh, Q will be this particular Q. So now, once you have a quadratic irrationality, you have a non-trivial stabilizer of that, of that real quadratic irrationality in SL2Z. And, and now there's a bit of folklore around the, around the relevant Pell's equation that says that you, can, you have an explicit you, you have an explicit, explicit description of the stabilizer. The stabilizer is isomorphic to the, the infinite cyclic multiplicative group generated by Q times plus or minus one. Um, this is a group of, 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 of non-zero, multiplicative group of non-zero elements uh, of the real quadratic number field. In fact, it lives in the order induced by the, that discriminant delta. Um, and the map is, is, is literally just this. The, Phi of G is G, you know, the two one entry of G times theta plus the two two entry of G. And so, if you now restrict to, if you like the the non trivial, so so you have so this so the stabilizer splits up into a Cartesian product. You have a, a, 
plus or minus the identity times a certain canonical cyclic subgroup with a canonical generator uh, in coming from that uh, norm positive fundamental unit. So this gives you a canonical family of non-commutative line bundles coming from those Heisenberg bimodules. So if n equals zero, set p n to be just the trivial line. And if n is non-zero, just set p n to be the Heisenberg bimodule corresponding to the, to the uh, element of SL to Z in the stabilizer of theta corresponding to Q to the n. And so the idea now is to package these uh, line bundles into a, a non-commutative principle circle bundle. And what's interesting is that all, all, all the pieces are already there. there it's, uh, I think, I'm blanking out the name, but there's a Japanese operator algebraist who I think basically computed the K theory of the beast we're gonna look at, um, but it, 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 it pieces together a lot of pieces. So the first step is to, is to give this thing a, a, the structure of an algebra. And the ingredients, again, are already there due to Schwartz, Ding Schwartz, and Polishuk Schwartz. Um, they have these, these canonical identifications of the, the balanced tensor product of Pn and Pn with P sub m plus n. In fact, they do this more generally for these Heisen, for Heisenberg modules, but now you have to fuss with which state has appear and which uh, elements of SL2Zs appear. But if we're just restricting to these non-commutative line bundles, it all simplifies to this. And by the way, this, this algebra structure is already present, for instance, in, in there's a paper by Polishuk and in, in the work of, of uh, Jorge Plazas and the work of in the paper of Vlasenko on uh, non commutative tutori with real, real multiplication. So you can happily treat this as a black box, um, but if you just want to sense for what these, what these multiplications look like, um, you, you, we can sketch it out this way. Um, so for any integer n, let a n, b n, c n, d n be the matrix cor corresponding to q to the n in the stabilizer of theta. If either m or n is zero, just use the bimodule structure. If m is non-zero and n is minus m, then you have this rather somewhat complicated looking non-degenerate pairing. And then if both m and n are non-zero and m plus n is non-zero, then you have this, this really quite baroque looking formula. Um, I, I wish I understood these formulas a bit better, but I do gather, I mean, uh, Schwartz had some, some intuitions. And it, from what I understand, if you say, okay, I'm going to take these two things explicitly written down in terms of, of uh, Schwartz spaces and try to see how to identify the balanced tensor product with, with th this other Schwartz space, um, then once you affect that balanced tensor product, then the, these sort of, after a lot of hard work, these uh, formulas drop out. So what, what's lovely is that these really are associative on the nose. You have literal commutative diagrams. So this really does become an algebra. Next, you need a star structure. Uh, and this is basically, uh, this, the star structure is due to Polishuk. Um, and, it's, and, 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 and the fact that it really does give you a star structure basically comes from uh, so, uh, something, a, res, a little result of Lasenko's. Um, so you can make it into a unital star algebra, this algebra P, such that uh, the adjoint of anything in degree M is of degree minus M. And so if M is, is zero, just use the star structure on the base. And if M is non-zero, you have this involution due to Polishuk. Then you can make this, you can give this a, a, a U1 action such that these each, the line bundles really are the isotypical components. And you can just do the obvious thing on degree N, you scale by Z to the N. And so to cut a long story short, this is a non-trivial, this non-cleft principle U1 star algebra. It's, it's principle since it's strongly graded. Um, the, P sub, uh, P sub M plus N is the span of, element of, of, of products of something in degree M and something of degree N for all M and N. Um, I can also point out if we're, if we're talking about uh, star structures, this is also pertinent. Um, if, 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 if you're feeling lazy, you can take this as a definition of uh, being a non-commuted principal circle bundle. It's equivalent to whatever you want to uh, impose. And it's non-trivial, which is to say it's not, a, not even a twisted cross product by Z. Since for instance, if you look at, 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 at the degree one isotypical subspace, the line bundle P1, think of it as a right A theta module 
well, this represents Q in the K theory of, of your non-commutative two torus, and that is not equal to one, which, repre which is represented by the trivial line. And, and, this, goes all, and this is basically just a, a lens computation from the compte rendu. Uh, so the question then is this, can you, can you, can you take these constant curvature connections on each of the pieces on each of the line bundles and, and see them as coming from a single non-commutative principle connection on this non-commutative principle circle bundle? And so that's the story I want to tell. We're going to be systematic. We're going to, we're going to start with the calculus on the base. We're going to build up a notion of horizontal uh, differential form. Form. We're going to uh, think about principal connections in terms of horizontal covariant derivatives and get a lot out of that besides. And then we'll justify this. We will, we will, we will, we will look at, at, at how to complete it to total calculi um, and see where that takes us. And, and, this, and the story will, in, in some sense, amount to a kind of synthesis of the usual story due to uh, Brzezinski, Majid, and Hayats, and many, many others. Um, and the sort of uh, complementary track taken by Djurjevic. Um, so on with the show. So let's start at the very base of the situation, at the bottom of the situation, let's start with the base. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough to be dealing with a very, very straightforward algebra with a well-known canonical differential calculus. Uh, so let B be the base, which is ultimately just uh, this uh, real quad, this, this non-commutative two torus with theta real quadratic. And, and recall that it's canonical two-dimensional calculus can be defined in the following way. You can, your, 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 your graded algebra of differential forms is generated over B by uh, two uh, supercentral skewer joint one forms, DT1 and DT2. And now you can package uh, your two partial derivatives, delta 1 and delta 2, into the exterior derivative uh, in the following fashion. You make these uh, dt1 and dt2 closed, and then you define the exterior derivative of an element of b in this fashion. Um, by the way, these pesky i's are appearing because with the, with the kind of uh, uh, convention I, I, I want to use, I'm using that convention, so 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 please bear that bear, bear that in mind. So, at first instance, the idea, if if we're if we're for the moment content to, for instance, follow your, uh, a bunch of people, in particular, this is a, a point of view espoused by Djurjevic. This is a point of view that falls out of the paper with Bram Esland. Um, the, the idea at first instance is to try to lift this differential calculus in the base to a differential calculus on the total space, some sort of horizontal differential calculus on the total space, whose, 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 whose exterior derivative restricts to these constant curvature connections on each isotypical subspace, on each line bundle. That's, that's the, the, the ultimate game. Uh, we're gonna see how to make it work. And then we're gonna justify this relative uh, to, to, to the sort of standard theory of Trzynski, Majid, Hayats, et al, Ali. So first off, we need a reasonable notion of horizontal, uh, of horizontal forms, and this will do the trick for us. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll view a horizontal calculus on P as consisting of uh, U1 equivariant graded star algebra, omega P horizontal over P. So these are just horizontal forms in the abstract together with an embedding of the, one for, of the, of the differential forms of B in this U1 graded U, U1 equivariant star algebra, such that the U1 invariant elements of, of, of this algebra of horizontal forms are precisely the basic forms. And the basic forms generate uh, the horizontal forms as a P by module. And it turns out, and this is, this is basically a little lemma in the recent book by Begs Majid. I don't know if you can track it uh, further, probably. Um, Given that the horizontal one forms are generated by the basic one forms as a p by module, this condition is actually equivalent to saying that the that the one forms that the horizontal one forms are generated as a left p module by the the basic one forms, um, and this is and this condition is basically a souped up condition of what what Hayat identified as the strong con, uh, connection condition. So. 
so 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 where do we go from there? So we have a notion of horizontal calculus. Now we need a suitable notion of horizontal derivative to complete this part of the picture. So suppose that we have a horizontal calculus and let's identify the, the, the basic forms with their, with their image and the horizontal forms. Then we can, when one can define a prolongable gauge potential with respect to this choice of horizontal uh, algebra of horizontal forms to be a, a, an equivariant star derivation on this U1 equivariant graded star algebra of horizontal forms that restricts to the, the exterior derivative, derivative of the base. So it's just a, an equivariant lift of the derivative on the base uh, to an exterior derivative on, on the entire algebra of horizontal forms. And, and because of the conditions we've imposed in a horizontal calculus, any choice of nabla is going to make omega p horizontal nabla into a U1 equivariant star DGA over p. And we'll denote by this, um, th there's a sort of moral story related to the Satya's uh, short exact sequence. I will denote by this, uh, the set of all prolongable gauge potentials. Um, by the way, the, the, the adjective prolongable appears in various places. It's because I'm taking lots of shortcuts here. Um, in the preprint, we really are, I, 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 you take a very sort of tedious approach of starting at the very bottom, looking at first order, then moving on to second order. So I'm cutting a long story short. So, so, what, so the, the problem we have before us is we want to find a horizontal calculus such that we can package the various uh, constant curvature connections into one of these prolongable gauge potentials. And so exploiting the particular sort of base that we have, um, we can, we, it's actually pretty easy to reverse engineer everything as follows. Um, the first thing to note is that using the horizontal calculus, the, the one forms are free as a left B module with basis DT1, DT2. And so too, therefore, is, uh, are, the one, are, the, are, the, are the horizontal one forms the left P module. So this is a, a free left P module with basis DT1, DT2. So once you're happy with this, each gauge potential is determined by the unique sort of covariant partial derivatives, D1, D2, uh, such that nabla of p is i d1 of p dt tau 1 plus i dt of p d tau 2. And so here's the thing, we have a, we have a candidate for d1 and d2. Basically package the, all the constant curvature connections together on each piece, together with the usual partial derivatives on the base, and see if we can make that work. And what, and what we'll actually find is that the precise sort of twisted Leibniz rules satisfied by those, by, by those constant curvature connections will dictate the right module structure. So this is where the right module structure is going to come from for us. So for convenience, let, for i equals one or two, let's package all the relevant constant curvature connections together with the, uh, the, the i-th partial derivative of the base into a single map uh, del i from p to p. And given a, a, a non-zero real scaling factor, epsilon, let's, let's, let's sigma epsilon denote the, the relevant uh, modular automorphism of p. Uh, so it's, it's re the, the restriction of sigma epsilon to degree n is just rescaling by epsilon to the minus n. So this restricts the identity of the base. It isn't necessarily a star automorphism, but it satisfies this, this uh, the next best thing. And it commutes with del i, with del one and del two. And so what Polishuk and Schwartz fi figured out, you know, expressed in, 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 in the terms relevant for today, is that del 1 and del 2, basically the repackaging of all the constant curvature connections on the line bundles uh, satisfy twisted Leibniz rules or twisted star derivations where you twist have to twist on the right by uh, the modular automorphism induced by Q, this uh, norm positive fundamental unit. And so because these are, these are twisted star derivations, twisted by specific modular automorphism, we now know what right uh, module structure to impose on our horizontal forms. We can, we can now set the, the, the full algebra structure on our algebra of horizontal forms. So we've now, we can now reverse engineer. Let omega p horizontal be the graded U1 equivariant star algebra generated over p by skew a joint 
uh, generators D tau one, D tau two, which are U one invariant, such that uh, with with the following relations, um, uh, they all square to one and they super commute with each other. And um, if you move an element of P from the, from the right of one of these things to the left, the price you pay is precisely this modular automorphism induced by Q. And now we can check that this is a horizontal calculus for P uh, that correctly reduces to the usual algebra of differential forms in the base. And the proposition is that there exists a unique uh, prolongable gauge potential, nabla naught, corresponding to those constant curvature connections. So we really can package. So if you're, if you're satisfied that, a, that, a, that, a, that a, a horizontal covariant derivative actually does satisfactorily encode a principal connection, then this is the principal connection that induces all the constant curvature connections on the line bundles. So there's a lot more to do. I'm probably rushing a bit, but are there any questions before I, I plow ahead? And, ag and again, please feel free to interrupt at any time. Okay. So this is all fine and dandy. We have the one relative gauge potential, uh, the one gauge potential. But now the natural question to ask is, okay, what else is there? Can we classify all the gauge potentials? And the answer will turn out to be yes. And so as, 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 as basically what became, what was, was apparent in the paper with, with Bram, but it was already, sort of, as, as Georgia Vittori thought about very hard, um, there, there, there's, a, there's a nice affine space structure. Um, the prolongable gauge potentials very naturally form an affine space as principal connections should. And the space of translations is given by what you might call relative, relative gauge potentials. And so these are U1 equivariant star derivations that vanish uh, on the base, in fact, on basic, all of the basic forms. So if, you can, so if you can figure out, so if you have one gauge potential, and if you can figure out what the space of translations is, then you figured out the entire affine space. And in this particular situation, Green means that it's specialized um, to this to the case study that you can, you can explicitly realize uh, you have an isomorphism of the space of translations with R2 uh, as, a, as real vector spaces. And, and basically what happens is that the point S1, S2 and R2 corresponds to the inner derivation uh, given by super commutation with this uh, self-adjoint one form here. So, if you like, this is a, this is a, a very non-commutative situation where every relative gauge potential is inner. Um, in general, uh, you can talk, you can you can pick out the inner relative gauge potentials. Um, you can you can quotient out things with the inner relative gauge potentials. Um, and if you look, for instance, at at uh, cro you know, cross products by actions of your favorite Hopstar algebra, say uh, your 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 favorite actions of your favorite discrete group. Um, in general, the relative gauge potentials will, will admit a description in terms of basically group cohomology, um, and the inner guys will be the one co-boundaries. So that's nice, um, but I claim that one can talk about gauge transformations as well. Basically, uh, we have this lifting procedure, and there are symmetries in the lifting procedure. So let's see what symmetries we have in, 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 the, in, the, in the process of lifting from basic forms to horizontal forms. So a caveat here, it's, it's, it's been understood very clearly since the 90s that automorphisms, algebra automorphisms are, are very restrictive when talking about uh, non-commutative gauge transformations. Um, indeed, there's been a lot of very, very interesting work. Um, I believe a student of, of uh, there's a recent PhD thesis from CISA that, that, that uh, like lead by algebraids or something. Like there's, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff over the last 20, 30 years, really thinking hard about what a gauge transformation in the quantum principle bundle case is in full generality. I'll be lazy and just deal with automorphisms. But what I want to emphasize is that in this best case scenario, you, you can, you can 
profitably make sense of differentiability, non-universal differentiability of your gauge transformations. So let's be, let's tentatively just say that a gauge transformation is a symmetry of this process of lifting from basic forms to horizontal forms. So let's define a gauge transformation of P with respect to this algebra of horizontal forms, this horizontal calculus, to be a U1 equivariant star automorphism of this graded star algebra of horizontal forms that restricts to the identity on basic forms. This defines a group, and you could actually think of it as a subgroup of the, uh, of the vertical star automorphisms of P, the U1 equivariant star automorphisms of P itself that restrict to the identity on uh, B. And what you can do, given the special nature of this, of, this, of this case, there's actually an explicit isomorphism of this group with U1. And this isomorphism, uh, and basically what happens, Z and U1 acts by the principal action of, 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 of U1 on P uh, as, 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 as extends naturally to omega P horizontal. So on a degree N, on, on the N degree N isotypical component of this U1 equivariant star algebra, uh, Z acts by Z to the N. So we'll justify why this is, why these are actually global gauge transformations later on. And now this admits an, uh, a, a very natural uh, affine action on, on this group of, of gauge transformations just by conjugation. In this case, the action is trivial, but it's a non-trivial fact that it's trivial. And in general, this, is a, this, this can be very non-trivial. And in, in all sorts of situations, if, if you like think about the cross product of C infinity of a manifold by a diffeomorphism, or think about the theta deformed complex hop vibration, um, the, the, the group of gauge tra transformations will act on the space of gauge potentials via a non-trivial homomorphism from the gauge group to the relative gauge potentials. Think of it as some sort of, sort of Maher-Cartan homomorphism. So that's the story. That's as far, much of the story as you can, you can say using just the horizontal piece of the calculus. And there's already a lot to say, but I haven't really justified any of these definitions relative to the total picture. Because really what we'd like to say is that, uh, that, that, that a principal bundle consists of a total space, which is a manifold, and a base space, which is a manifold, and that, there are, uh, and that there's an interaction between the differential geometry of the total space, that of the base space, that of the structure group. So now we need to see how, how to recover total calculi from the, the horizontal calculus. Um, and we need to see sort of what prices we paid for this pick for, 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 for this sort of ansatz. So this is the next, the, the final part of the story. So I'll be lazy today and I'll focus on, if you like, the, these sort of Q deformed, let me use H bar as a parameter, H bar deformed calculi on U1. But if you're dealing with a general Hopf star algebra, you, you can work with any bicovariant calculus you like. Uh, but past a certain point, you have to use Voronovich's uh, prolongation at least to degree two. This, this actually becomes important at the end. So let H bar be a positive real parameter. And recall the, the, uh, your h bar number. So if n is an integer, if h bar is one, just let n, let the h, h bar integer n just be n if h bar is one. Otherwise, let it be h bar to the n minus one over h bar minus one. Um, this satisfies all the usual properties you like. It satisfy, satisfies in particular a certain nice co one co cycle uh, equation. And now let's set up our little algebra of by invariant one forms of U1 induced by this choice of H bar. So let uh, lambda sub H bar be the, the graded algebra generated by the nilpotent skewer joint element D sub H bar T. And now for convenience, given a graded U1 star algebra omega, let's define the certain braided product of, of lambda h bar with omega as follows. We take the tensor product, the usual graded tensor product of lambda h bar and omega, 
and we mod out this relation, anytime we take an element, a degree one ele a degree n element of omega past dh bar t, um, in the sense of supercommutation, we have to apply the modular automorphism induced by h bar. And we and we and we define the u and now we can extend the u one action on omega to the entirety of this by making uh, by declaring this one form to be u one invariant. In general, you're going to have um, uh, a crossed module, and there'll be non-trivial braided relations. So, in particular, if we're thinking about an algebra with a, with a P with a U1 action, a particular principle U1 star algebra. This is already enough to talk about vert purely vertical forms on this algebra. So we can define the vertical calculus of P with respect to this choice of H of, 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 of differential calculus on U1 to be the following star DGA. So your vertical forms will basically be, uh, you take P and a joint and nil potent skew a joint U1 invariant one form D sub H bar T uh, and then pose this braided commutation relation, a uh, super commutation relation. That gives you your vertical forms. And now what's your vertical derivative? Well, if P is in, in, is in the nth isotypical subspace of P, you define the vertical derivative of P like this. So when h bar is equal to one. This is the usual partial derivative. This is the usual Lie derivative um, you know, by the infinitesimal generator of the u1 action. Um, but if h bar is not equal to one, you get something a little uh, subtler. So we'll consider this entire family. And what we'll see is that there will be a specific choice of h bar forced upon us if we really want to make uh, those constant cur curvature connections work as a principal connection. The, that gives rise to a, a full uh, star DGA. So this is, so here's a big assembly, assemblage of a whole lot of, 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 of definitions due to different people at, at, at different points in time, um, starting with, with Brzezinski Midget's paper, um, clarifications in Hyatt's paper, Djurjevic has some insights, Begs Majid's book has some insights, a lot of people had some insights, and use a convenient repackaging in for this particular context. Um, this is very slick. If you stare at it long enough, you'll, you'll, you'll rightly complain that a lot of this is hard to check, um, but this is tediously sort of unpackaged in the preprint in a way that is less slick than this, but is easier to check computationally. So what I want to characterize is, 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 is what I want from a, a, a differential calculus on the total space to give a principal connection, to give a, sorry, a, what do I mean by differentiable quantum principal bundle over B? So we have a top, this, 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 if you like the total space P uh, as a topological quantum, quantum principal circle bundle over B. We have a differential calculus over the base B. What does it mean to have a differential calculus on the total space that realizes P is a differentiable quantum principal circle bundle with base B uh, endowed with this differential calculus? So let's say that omega P DP is, 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 is a U1 equivariant star DGA over P. We'll say that it's H bar principal over, uh, over omega B DB. If you can embed uh, omega B as, 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 as as U1 invariant forms on P in such a way that DB is the restriction of DP to the basic forms. And if the following two things hold. So first, you need to have a good notion of restriction to vertical, uh, of restriction of, 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 of differential forms uh, to evaluation on, on vertical uh, vector fields, on fundamental vector fields. So what this means is that you have a subjective, uh, a subjective morphism uh, this vertical map from omega p to the to, from the total form to the vertical forms uh, that restricts the identity on 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 degree zero and 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 behaves in the following way. Um, 
and, and with respect to the exterior derivative, um, if, you, if you take an exterior derivative of something in degree zero and follow it up with the vertical map, that's the same thing as the vertical exterior derivative of that element. So it's, it's, it's if you like, a surjective morphism of the total calculus with the uh, vertical calculus that, that, that uh, restricts to the identity on the base. Moreover, the kernel of this uh, is generated as a left module, uh, as, as, as a left omega p, as a, a graded uh, omega p module by the uh, basic one forms. So this is a souped up version of this sort of strong connection condition. So that's one piece of the puzzle. The second piece of the puzzle is that you need to have a well-defined notion of uh, interior product with a single uh, fundamental vector field. So, we so, so this means that we can define, again, a morphism from the total calculus to this uh, braided product of the invariant forms on U1 with the, total the, the, the algebra of total uh, forms that corresponds to uh, taking internal product with a single, uh, with a single uh, fundamental vector field in one slot. So this, this should restrict to the identity on, on, on degree zero. And then on degree one, uh, it's, you get two pieces. Uh, if you apply this interior product to a, a one form on P, you get that one form plus the, plus what you get oh, this restriction to vertical, uh, this restriction to a vertical one form. So, so this is, so this encodes. I think there's this is similar in spirit to a construction uh, due to uh, Dubois, Violet, and Landi. Um, and so, so what you need out of this is that is, is that the subalgebra, the the graded star subalgebra, the U one invariant graded star subalgebra of all forms on P, such that this interior product acts as the identity on those one forms. So the kernel of the identity minus this interior product map is precisely um, is, 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 is the star subalgebra generated by uh, is generated is as a left P module generated by the basic one forms. So and, and particularly you need this to be a horizontal calculus. So if you like the kernel of this interior product thing, this is these are your horizontal forms. And then you need something a bit bigger to be the kernel of this of, of this restriction to the fibers map. Um, if you're just working through degree one, these two maps basically are, are give you exactly the same information. But the moment you want to work with 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 uh, higher degree differential forms, uh, these are these, these are two pieces of the puzzle. Um, and so given this, we can now talk about Synthesis of total calculi. So re recall our simplifying situation. We're dealing with circle bundles. We're restricting to these these uh, HR deformed uh, calculi. We have a two dimensional calculus on the base. So just zero forms, one forms, two forms, um, and we have a compatible. Hor uh, we have this particular choice on the base, and we have a compatible uh, calculus of ho into a horizontal calculus algebra of horizontal forms. So. This definition will pick no, will now pick out those gauge potentials that permit the reconstruction of, of the full differential calculus. We'll say that a gauge potential is H bar adapted whenever this, this gauge potential nabla satisfies the following. Nabla squared factors through the vertical uh, is, is a, if you like a vertical first order uh, differential operator with respect to the given a bicovariant calculus on the structure group. It means you, you should have a U1 equi equivariant morphism of P star bimodules, F of nabla from the vertical one forms to the vertical two forms. Uh, this is your curvature two form. Think of it as a Lie valued two horizontal two form on P such that nabla squared factors like this. And now since we're working with circle bundles over, over two dimensional non commutative spaces, uh, we don't have to truncate at degree two. It makes sense to talk about Bianchi identities. And now in this case, you have also have a, this Bianchi identity here. Um, and now given that we have a Bianchi identity, this is, this is cubic. Um, and so given that we have a Bianchi identity, 
uh, we have a cubic subset of all adap H-bar adapted uh, uh, gauge potentials, which we denote like this. And now here's the thing. You can let H-bar vary and see where you actually get anything. And it turns out that that you have that that this this the set of h bar adapted gauge potentials in our particular case is non-zero if and only if h bar is equal to q squared. Where remember q isn't just any random q. Q is specifically this this norm positive fundamental unit of the of the real quadratic uh, field induced by theta. In which case every uh, gauge potential is h bar adapted. And the curvature two form uh, and of of any uh, gauge potential is the same. It's it's a constant it's it's constant curvature. It's a it's a it's a Q monopole. And the Q star you see is exactly it's it's exactly the Q star you see uh, formally in the case of the of of, of the Q of the complex uh, Q deformed Hopf vibration. You're Q deformed uh, in general, but your bicovariant calculus on U one is Q squared deformed. Um, and it's Q squared to form basically for the same formal reason. Um, your module, by module of one forms is Q deformed, but your curvature two form needs to go from vertical one forms to horizontal two forms. So since your horizontal two forms are Q squared deformed, your vertical one forms must be Q squared deformed as well for to have a, a sensible curvature two form. So the only case where you have any h bar adapted gauge potentials is where h bar is q squared, in which case you, all your gauge potentials are q monopoles for that particular q. Uh, you need the q squared deformed bicovariant calculus of u1, and then your 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 curvature two form is given like this. It's a it's a it's a constant uh, it's constant curvature. It really is a q monopole, and so. Why bother with, the, with this definition? This is the reason for this definition. Your h bar adapted, if and only if you can you can take the obvious sort of exterior derivative from zero forms to one forms, induced by your vertical exterior derivative and your gauge potential nabla, and extend it to really get a, a star DGA on the a, a full star DGA. The, the whole problem is getting something that squares to zero. And, get, and getting something that squares to zero is exactly what gives you um, this h bar, the, 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 you know, those, those, these two conditions here. It's exactly what forces this condition upon you. And, it, and so that d squared from zero forms to two forms is zero forces this on you, that d squared from one forms to three forms is zero forces this in addition on you. And so as a consequence of this, if we really want to have full total calculi, we have no choice. If we want to build full total calculi from these constant curvature connections, we have no choice. We have to view P as a UQ squared of one uh, bundle. So now you can, so, 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 so in, in, in what little time is remaining, I'm, I'm almost done. What I want to address are two questions. First off, what about gauge transformations? Why is this notion of global gauge transformation justified? And second, there's another sort of problem lurking in the background. I'm constructing differential total differential calculi, but I made no claims whatsoever that any of them are isomorphic to each other as differential calculi over p. But I claim that you can you can work out what's going on. Um, so first off, let's talk about why, why we are getting principal connections and gauge transformations. So let me just first point out that you can, you can refine the usual notion of strong bimodule connection uh, to, this, to this higher order context. Um, we can define a prolongable connection on our H bar principal star DGA to be a U1 equivariant endomorphism of the, one, of the total one forms as a p star by module, not just as a right by module. So you have you split the atia shorted Zach sequence as a shorted Zach sequence of u1 equivariant p star by modules, and then you, to cut a long story short, and again, you can simplify these th things to conditions you can actually uh, plausibly check. Um, you can use pi itself to get a projection onto the uh, basically onto the ver onto vertical forms. 
And then you can use the identity minus pi to get a projection onto horizontal forms. Um, and so given a gauge potential and a horizontal calculus and, and a choice of, 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 uh, of, of calculus on the, on the structure group induced by H bar, um, if you form this sort of direct sum uh, calculus, then the orthogonal, then the projection onto the vertical forms along the horizontal forms will be an example of such a prolongable connection. So taking a bird's eye view, wh what more justifiable is a global gauge transformation if you're concerned with total calculi? Well, if we're taking this bird's eye view and, and cutting certain corners, we can fit it all together, in, not into a group, but into a groupoid. Um, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, I'm not going to presuppose that any of these total calculi are actually isomorphic. So instead, I'm, I'm going to allow the isomorphism, I, I'm going to allow them to be non-isomorphic. So, so I'm going to get a groupoid. So the objects of the groupoid are going to be uh, principal star DGA for P over, the, over the, the choice of calculus on the base, admitting a prolongable connection. Um, whose algebra of horizontal, on horizontal forms recovers the fixed choice of horizontal calculus. And we're going to declare an arrow from one such calculus DGA to another to be U1 equivariant uh, star, graded star isomorphism of star DGA, which may be non-trivial on the base, that such that uh, F restricts on basic forms to the identity, it intertwines the uh, exterior derivatives, um, and it intertwines this interior product with a single fundamental vector, fundamental vector field. And then the groupoid law is just composition of maps. Uh, and so if you put all this together, you have an abstract notion of, of an action of gauge transformations on connections. Let so let curly G sub H bar be this groupoid. Let curly A sub H bar be the set of all triples where you have an object, uh, you know, the suitable star DGA on the total space and pi a prolongable connection for that particular star DGA. Uh, this groupoid acts naturally uh, on this set. And so you can form the, cross, the, the action groupoid of that groupoid action. And what I claim is that you have an, a, an equivalence of groupoids between the action group of the affine action of this honest group on this cubic subspace of an affine space with this abstract action groupoid of a groupoid acting on some strange abstract set given basically by reconstruction of total calculi. So, so in particular, this justifies the notion of gauge transformation. And this is an equivalence of groupoids with explicit homotopy inverse. In fact, it realizes this groupoid as a deformation retraction of this groupoid, and everything is extremely ex explicit. And so in our case, this means that um, this, the gauge theory, this, this groupoid encoding the gauge theory, essentially, is uh, isomorphic to this gauge group, this action groupoid which is either the uh, action group point of the trivial action of U1 on the plane if H bar is Q squared or the empty set otherwise. So this is justifying the notion of gauge transformation. And again, dealing with vertical stall automorphisms is very restrictive. I understand this. But what I want to point out is that you can handle differentiability of gauge transformations in a, redu in, in a robust fashion along these kinds of lines. And now finally, what, is what about the problem of isomorphism? I haven't actually, I, I make no guarantees that different gauge potentials are going to give you isomorphic calculi, not even to as at the level of first order differential calculi. That's a price you have to pay, but I, I, I would contend that it's a price worth paying. If you go down this route and you look at trivial things, you can, you can basically do everything in terms of group cohomology. Uh, this is in the preprint uh, for those morbidly curious. Um, uh, here already, what I claim is that you can get an explicit, if you like, gauge equivariant moduli space of the first order of, of, of differential calculi. And now to do that, it, it, it turns out we're lucky we can do everything in terms of an, an, an affine action of a certain subspace of translations. Let's say that a, a relative gauge potential is canonically H bar adapted whenever we can find, a, whenever it factors through a relative connection one form. So that's a U1 equivariant morphism of 
P star by modules from vertical one forms to, to horizontal one forms, such that uh, basically a relative gauge potential is a is a is a horizontal one form valued uh, vertical differential operator with symbol that relative connection one form. And then here is sort of you could be like a, a sort of like a, a degenerate version of this sort of the braided a, a kind of basically the braided uh, commutation relations needed for Voronovich's uh, prolongation. In this case, it all reduces to saying we need the we need this two, this horizontal one form to square to zero. Um, and now we can consider the subset of all canonically H adapted uh, relative uh, gauge potentials. And so in our particular case, this, this subset is not is non-zero if and only if h bar is q, not q squared, in which case every gauge relative gauge potential is canonically h bar adapted, and you can and you can uh, recover and you and you can say exactly what the relative gauge potential is uh, for anything you like. So why why bother with this notion? Well, this is why. If you look at, 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 at two objects in this, this abstract gauge group ploy, they, they, you see you have these star differential graded algebras. Think of them as, as, cal as calculi over P, and you want to know when they are isomorphic as calculi over P, so isomorphic over the identity on P. Um, it turns out that they are isomorphic if and only if they are isomorphic in the quotient uh, as object, they're equal as objects in a certain quotient of this groupoid, the quotient of this groupoid by the kernel of the forgetful map that, that sends an arrow to the corresponding vertical automorphism of P. And now here's, here's the theorem, and, 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 and this is a tricky beast um, when, you're, when you're working through degree two in, in generality, this requires Voronovich's prolongation. The subset of canonical H bar, canonical H bar adapted gauge potentials is actually a gauge invariant subspace it's actually a subspace, even though it's defined by a quadratic condition, that leaves the, the, the H bar adapted gauge potentials invariant under translation. And moreover, that equivalence of groupoids ascends to an isomorphism of groupoids from this, uh, from this action groupoid. So this is the action groupoid of the affine action of gauge transformations on this cubic subset of an honest to God affine space with the desired groupoid. So this is really giving you, this is really reali realizing this, uh, this cubic subspace of an affine space, cubic subset of an affine space as a moduli space, a gauge equivalent moduli space of all the calculi you're getting, the isomorphism classes of calculi you're getting. And in our case, the only case that, that's not trivial is where h bar equals q squared. Um, and in that case, you're, you're, uh, you're parameterized by R2. And in particular, the elements of R2 can be related after a, a linear change of parameterization to these holomorphic structures uh, studied by Polishuk and Schwartz, but that's probably a, a, a matter for another time. Anyhow, thank you all for your patience. That is all for today. Thank you. All right, thanks, uh, Benamir. Thanks, let's. Questions, comments? Uh, yes, I, I just have uh, some comment. So I, I like very much this uh, fact that you mentioned at some point that you have this quantum group U1 Q square. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very nice. That's a very nice thing. I was wondering whether it can be used, you know, for the problem which is analogous to the problem of complex multiplication and so on, because I mean, it, it gives some structure which seems to be quite, uh, quite strong. Uh, uh, I, I, don't uh, I I don't know enough a number theory to to, to answer that question, but I, I'm like I'm super curious because this is clearly lurking in the background. Like these, so for instance, there's yeah, yeah, this uh, yeah. homogeneous coordinate al algebra um, mm -hmm. that considered by, for instance, by Polisho Kampazas and Lasenko, and that's and that's clearly yeah. that's going to be the, the the kernel of of you know basically del one plus tau del two uh -huh. on okay. P. Okay, uh, so I have a, another general thing which, which I don't understand because, I mean, you know, uh, when you take a spectral triple, mm -hmm. there is a notion of gauge potential and there is a notion of corresponding gauge connections and so on. And for instance, with Mark, we had done the Young-Mills theory for the non-commutative tori, 
and we had uh, we had found that the moduli space was something very interesting because it was kind of a classical space while the so so i mean uh, what i don't grasp totally is the distinction between doing gauge theory like one does naturally for spectral triples and doing this principal bundle theory as you present it which is probably more structured, but I, I don't understand, uh, you know, the relation between the two somehow. So, so, so this is sort of, I, I, I could be wrong, but, but uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain flavor to the, the almost commutative picture where you're almost in some sense accessing the adjoint bundle without bothering with the underlying principal bundle. Exactly. I, I don't know if that's- Exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But then I think, you know, that what would be really, very interesting. I don't know if it can be done easily, but would be to take the almost commutative case, as you were mentioning, and try to see, because I mean, this has been a dream for many years, try to see if by translating the gauge theory in your language, one would discover, as you have discovered, for instance, this U1 uh, Q square symmetry, uh, uh, which is underlying the bundle itself one would discover a further symmetry, which is not seen from the... So here's it may be a useful uh, observation in that regard. So in, in, in this paper, paper with Bram, um, yeah. so we don't assume any kind of vertical spin C condition. Okay. And so what this means is when you have the, 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 the total space, and this is all in the language of spectral triples and, and unbundled KK theory, when you have the, the yeah. your total space, and you go down to the base without the vertical spin C condition, you can't go all the way to the base. Rather, you have the analog of a, of a topologically non-trivial, almost commutative spectral triple. And so there's mm -hmm. this sort of Clifford algebra of, of the dual of the Lie algebra. I understand, yes, yes, yes Floating yes. around. So, so, so what I wonder if, 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 if and in, in general, what something that, that has yet to be worked out is, so here everything is functional analytic. <laughs> but so in principle, you should be able to restrict to an isotypical subspace or, 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 or yes. you know, yes. take an associated geometry yes. and there do the spectral action. Um, I understand. I understand. But what, what I am asking for is the following is that, okay, you see, I mean, what, what I retain from your explanations was this quite remarkable fact that you have this U1 Q square. Yeah. which is an additional sort of unexpected somehow symmetry of the situation. Now, uh, so what I am asking for, yeah. when you take the, the, the good model for the standard model, which is in fact enhanced because it's, a, uh, it's more like a Patisala model. Uh, if you take that, then one would, would dream for you know, a, a, a symmetry, which is not obvious at all, but which would appear from a, a study like you are doing, which is where you, what you are doing, if I understand correctly, you are taking seriously the geometric structure of the total space, which we are not used to do because we don't need it. I mean, you know, we don't need it at all. So, so I mean, uh, I think this would be really, and, and it's related to ideas which have been floating around, but which so far have not been um, seen uh, an accomplishment, if you want, in, in, in the case of the standard model. And uh, I mean, you know, for instance, okay, I was dreaming for many years of the fact that the finite quantum group at uh, cubic root of unity would appear. But okay, I mean, <laughs> it didn't show up so far. So, so, so maybe um, here, here, here's one uh, possible avenue for this, if, if you have, so, so I guess it's now an established fact that the classical manifold don't have quantum symmetries, but if you have an almost commutative spectral triple, this could have yeah. quantum symmetries. Exactly. That's so, exactly. So, 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 so you could have like a, like a finite quantum structure group. Exactly. That's which exactly could have a calculus, et cetera, et cetera. That's so, exactly so, what I am talking about. So there it's could be room for this. I'm talking about, and, and, you know, I mean, of course, I mean, you know, the, 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 what you would get then would be a fantastic thing because, okay, then, you know, you would uh, get relations and so on and so forth. I mean, so, so, I mean, this is, a, I think uh, this gives a lot of value to the general uh, development that you are doing, I think. In, in at least in my mind, okay. Oh, well, th thank you for the comments. Yeah. Um, Anything else? Twins. Uh, I had a remark about your use of H bar. 
So you know, in physics, h bar tends to uh, to zero and not to one. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess e, e to the uh, h bar would be more. Appropriate. Yeah, so when you say h and q, and you you put them on the same footing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, it, it was out, out of desperation because because at the end I want to make a choice, and I want to emphasize that that particular Q, this this norm positive fundamental unit, is is sure. what's no, superior. Yeah. Uh, but my yeah, no, it should have been e to the h bar, I suppose. Or minus h bar. Or my, e to the minus h bar. Sorry. Yes. Bleh. Right. If nothing else, then well, thanks again, Branimir. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So we will meet again at uh, least in this uh, part of the world in two weeks. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye, bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>